Welcome to High Road U. We're delighted that you're taking your valuable time to join us, and we welcome you to Don't Miss IMIS, Five Ways to Measure that what, what Might Be Passing You By, with Suzanne Carawan from High Road Solution. If you're currently dialed into the telephone conference, remember this is a toll number, but if you have a voice over IP connection on your computer, please hang up and click mic and speakers under the audio panel on the right side of your screen. A PDF copy of today's presentation has been made available to you to print or download. You may access this document under the materials panel on the right side of your screen. Your presenter encourages questions, so please ask when prompted by clicking the chat panel and typing in your question. Our content leaders will try and incorporate in your questions during the, the session, but will address them during the Q&A portion at the end of the session. Please remember that High Road Solution is an authorized provider of CAE credits you are only eligible for to report this webinar for CAE credit if you attend live and for the entire session. Our session is eligible for one CAE credit. At this time, I would like to introduce your speaker. Suzanne has spent her career working in marketing using primarily digital communication means. Suzanne has crafted the brand stories for dozens of software companies and not-for-profits alike. With over 15 years consulting to associations and nonprofits on websites, email, and social media, Suzanne is an expert at helping organizations to grow. Her passion is working with organizations to build capacity in digital marketing and helping to reallocate marketing budgets from traditional to digital means to reduce costs and increase impact. Currently serving as CMO of SA, ASAE endorsed e marketing solution provider, Hyro Solution, Suzanne has the, hon the honor of creating educational programs for, for High Road U that have provided education for more than 1,000 not-for-profit professionals since its inception. It is my pleasure to now turn the program over to Ms. Carolyn. Please begin. And full disclosure. Oh, hi everybody, welcome to today's session. And to, since we're talking about IMA specifically today, I'm going to make some commentary about that and just in full disclosure so you understand how High Road fits into the IMAS world, we are an authorized IMAS consultant. And so some of the things we're going to talk about today are obviously things of how we work with IMAS and how we work with um, many other organizations across the association industry regardless of what system you're on. But IMAS now, with the new announcements and the new products out, especially with RISE and the communication suite, really can help us to get much further along in uh, automation and getting uh, quickly to where we're trying to go, which is really, for most organizations, inbound. High Road itself, we specialize in email automation inbound, but it's really put in that order because email is kind of the, it is our history, it's our legacy of what we come from, but really what we focus in on now, we have very few people that come to us and say, I just want to buy a new email system. Really what they're already in is the middle, which is automation, and talking about how can we do more without human hands touching it, so actually utilizing our technology to, to make it smart so we can do more, exactly where communication suite fits in. I was delighted to see that last week. Um, at the uh, Innovations Conference and at uh, NIAG uh, the week before. And even more so now, we're getting into the world of inbound and how that works with all the data that we've diligently collected over the years, and that gets into a whole new stage of the game when it comes to your association business and has huge ramifications across the board as to what you can do with it. So that's really what we're going to explore today and talk about some of the changes that are going on in the world. So when we start talking about automation and inbound, clearly we can't automate. We probably all understand this. We can't automate unless you have the data. So if you haven't collected the data, it's certainly going to be a step one to automation because everything in automation relies on both starting data and then some sort of response and input of data from the recipient. So that, so once we kind of get that, we're even moving already beyond automation. So we're, we're really now when we're at the start of talking about inbound. And when inbound happens, it revolves around, again, how well do you really know your members? So how much do you know about them? How much data have you collected from them? And just this question alone uh, breaks open the mindset that has been long established in the association industry, 
which is kind of an us versus them mentality between the staff and the membership. Uh, many times uh, organizations live in fear of actual members calling or actually submitting information or emailing them out. Um, they're hoping, they see that um, they kind of measure success that all's quiet on the Western Front and no one's, uh, and no one's complaining. But in the world of inbound, that's actually the kiss of death. The last thing you want is a silent uh, membership base. You want people who are interacting with you and more importantly, the big shift between push marketing and let's say going to inbound is that they're coming to you and interacting with you on their own volition. This has huge implications for the business because it means that nine times out of 10, we need to reposition our products, our events, our content, and we need to stop doing push out a blast email that is one message to everyone and meaningful to none. And so the question becomes, if I need to make really meaningful communications, if I really need to truly be able to price right, position a product or service right, go after the right target markets, I need data to do that. I cannot operate on gut feeling or the board member, one board member said, or you know the director of whatever membership said. We have to really get into the mindset of do we know our members? And we're now in a new world, a new game, where we're saying how well do we know our members? How well do we know the people that we want to be our members but aren't members today? And that might be the same thing for replace member with donor, exhibitor, attendee, um, board member, volunteer. So anybody that you're going after, how well do we know them? And we need to look at that. If we don't know them well, then we need to really identify techniques and a methodology for getting to know them better. And in today's world, we want to know them quite well. So we call that know your know. How much do you really know if we were looking at our membership? And here's something that comes up all the time when I go out and consult. So for typically the last 10 to 20 years, we have been in a steady state. We've been in maintenance mode. We have been diligently collecting transactional information, demographic information, relationship information, and very, very lightweight behavioral information, such as do you want to opt out or opt into emails? Did you open and click? Did you choose the fish or the salmon or the salmon or the steak or whatnot for maybe some of your um, events? So we have some interest, we have some insight into a little bit of their behavior. And we might have some membership surveys and things like that, but we probably didn't ask questions that truly gives us enough insight into the member or the donor or the attendee or the registrant, et cetera, about him or her preferences, choices. And we're in the world now of what we've gotten to is it's great that we have all that because we're ready now to jump into the world of collecting behavioral information and talking about real engagement. So behavioral information is the root of what we're going after when we go through growth. In order to grow in today's world, we have to know where people are, we have to know who we're targeting, we have to be able to relate to them and have an offer that resonates with them. And our biggest hope in today's world is we're gonna take them one step closer to conversion, to taking the action that we desire, whether that be registration, whether that be um, joining or renewing, but we have to give up this idea that if we keep sending enough emails, we're gonna break them down and they're gonna renew because this power has greatly shifted. We have now the human that we're trying to communicate to is bogged down with massive amounts of communication and information at any point, and we know that 70% of their buying decision is made before they ever come to your website or ever interact with you. And a lot of it is now made by word of mouth and referrals, which means that we've got to find a way to get into the decision set as to when someone is thinking, where is, you know, uh, where do I get that information? Where can I go to find other people like me? We need our association to be in that top three. We need to be top of mind or our event or exactly, you know, what have you. And we need to get in front of now, and here's the critical part, we need to not only do that, we got to get in front of people who don't already know us, okay? This is probably the biggest stumbling block. Once we break through this mindset shift, um, pretty much everything else gets, it gets interesting, but it's amazing that people have never thought of this idea that email is only good for people that you already know. If you don't have their email address, you're dead in the water. How are you going to communicate? And then most organizations have not done a tremendous 
uh, job over the last 10 years about doing uh, campaigns to acquire email addresses. And that's really where digital marketing comes in and certainly inbound because getting that, that email address, which is considered the driver's license or social security number of the digital age, is the key component that we need to first establish. Okay? So in order to get people's email addresses, we're now going to play this game of how do we do that. And that's going to be very important for our growth strategy or getting into new groups that we didn't have. I hear millennials 35,000 times a day. Maybe you do too. How do we get more millennials? How do we attract millennials, et cetera? Probably not through email. You know, you, there's a place for email, but you're not going to be able to just email millennials, and that's going to probably transform, you know, your membership numbers. So we need to be able to understand these dynamics of population shifts, how different communication methods match up with different generations, all of those things. And how are we going to do that? We've got to get down to collecting behavioral information. So at the end of the day, you know, you could say, well, how much information do we need is usually the question that I guess I get asked by the C-suite or the, you know, heads of marketing or heads of IT or boards and uh, all the kind of people I normally work with. And they ask, um, how much is enough? And I said, you know, for marketers, we're really only happy when we get down to the level like we know a tooth, you know, toothpaste brand you buy and you use. And if you use it regularly or do you switch up? You know, how do you feel about those things? And that's a little tongue-in-cheek kind of thing. But the answer is the more you know, the more you can grow. The more you know, the more you can engage. The more you know, you know, you're going to be able to uh, get into a positive feedback loop with your recipient, and they will be able to continue to serve up information to you, and you can, now here's the key, you have to be nimble enough that you respond to what they're telling you and can continue to serve up information that's of interest. We're in the state of inbound world now, or just the digital consumer, the div, you know, using digital means, that the other part is you cannot hoodwink anyone anymore. It is plainly obvious if you're just trying to send fluff content in an email and you're barely, uh, you know, you kind of just put it around the big button that says join now or early bird registration. It's really obvious, especially as you look at generations. So what, what works again for maybe the baby boomers, that might still work. But if you're trying to go after Gen X, you're trying to go after millennials, we're in, we're in all sorts of problems. That stuff is just, it's just not going to fly. So they have, uh, they have huge detectors on that, which means we have to change up our communications, and we probably need to get to know those people. Now, all of this, the caveat, we have to know who we're trying to go after, but the key there is you're going to have to do more. You're going to have to break up your targets. You're going to have to spend more time on creative of making the right copy and the right graphics and the right call to action of what you're trying to get them to do, tell the right stories, use the right language, all of that. It takes more time. Where did the time come from? You already automated things. You got on the right systems, so you freed up the time. So we, we're in a world of we're transferring uh, where we're spending our time as a workforce. We're moving away from redundant, repetitive rigmarole, like uploading lists and cutting and pasting uh, emails together. That's crazy. We want to use the data that we've got in IMS to personalize, to be able to better target. And we want to really just all of our regular communications, the day-to-day -day, um, pieces of one-off emails and whatnot, put all that through a communication suite. For our newsletters, let's do something else we'll talk about in a second that's far more um, contextually based for the individuals. And let's get smarter about the, the platforms we're using to collect this information. So on the behavioral side, now we're talking about two types of information that we want to collect. We want to collect the type of self-reported behavioral information. For example, when you, if you've gone to the uh, physician lately, they ask you some dreaded questions like, how many days a week do you exercise for how long? How much alcohol do you consume in a week? So this is what you're self-reporting, right? Um, for most people, maybe you're, you'll shock to know this, most people don't actually accurately report that. <laughs> so they will say, oh, I have a, you know, three glasses of wine in a week. And if I actually then study that person to see what you reported versus what you actually did, we might see a discrepancy. Okay? So we need to be able to collect both things. That's the ideal. So we're going to ask a lot of questions. We're going to get into a value exchange with our recipient. But we also need methods where we can study them 
really without us them having to do any work is the key. And that's where inbound and that automation kind of um, they cross paths. So why behavioral? We want behavioral data because not only does it help us to match up the right content to the right person to the right offer and understand where they are in their decision making process, but it, what it does really from a business standpoint is we stop being so rear focused. When you're looking at reporting data all the time, when you're looking at click-through and open rates, it's all retro-facing. It's what happened. It doesn't give me any insight or even beg the question of what should I be doing next. It's like you don't really know. You're like, well, they opened the email, but that's all I know. Uh, they clicked on something, but that's all I know. So behavioral data, where you can string it all together, is moving the whole organization from being uh, waiting and then guessing, really, to being in a sense and respond mode. You're moving to being predictive and proactive. That means we're moving to forecasting, not reporting. Okay, we're sitting around the table now and they're saying, we're saying, whoa, did you see what these people are doing and where they came from and what, and this and the topics that they're interested in and then what content they consume? Well, what else should we feed these people? And so what that helps us to do is to really hone our offering to our recipients so we can elicit the right response. This whole thing is in the branch of discipline called social marketing. I didn't say social media marketing, I said social marketing. It is how we can move people to uh, get them to elicit the right response that we desire, okay, and then measure that and understand how we continue to hone it. So why is word of mouth and social so important? So as we said, the, the buyer's journey has really shifted. The way people find information, the way they're communicating, how much research they're doing, uh, where they're going to get recommendations, uh, unfortunately, it is largely not from the association. It is really all the things around the association. So where 10 years ago, I could hammer people and basically say, the association saith this, and we are holding this meeting, and you will come on this date, and you will move you through the line, and you will go to the buffet at 12 p.m., and you will get on the bus and go to the after event happy hour, and you will go to these sessions and not have to register, et cetera. Now we're moving through a different buyer's journey where all the power is in the hands of the recipient. And that doesn't matter if they're receiving email or they're going to an event or they're participating in a certification program or whatnot. Everyone now is fully empowered to vote with their feet and also to um, speak the truth from their viewpoint you know, via digital. So it's a different world. So it has huge repercussions for all of our you know, usual areas of running business processes within associations. Education, how we staff the association or the nonprofit, um, the events that we do, certifications we have, books that we sell, the whole thing has to be really rethought and see if we're testing it based on what these particular groups of buyers want to see. Okay? So that means that there's really five new areas for us to explore. This is where we get into, okay, how can we do more with this? Because, great, we're sitting on our wonderful IMAS database that has a ton of information in it. We've done so much of the heavy lifting to this point. Now we just need to add on this additional layer of this behavioral data so we can get the comprehensive picture. Because for most times if I came into your organization and I said, let's pull out a random list of, you know, two people per member type, pull them up and let's look at them, and I could look at them and say, okay, how much do I know about them? Can I predict their next move based on their you know, job title, their organization, where they live, et cetera? If I don't have additional information, I probably am like, well, here's what I know. I know that they went to the annual meeting two years ago, and I know they haven't returned. It doesn't look like they've moved. They've paid their dues, and um, they haven't bought anything. So that's what I'm working with. So it's, it's, we're, we're, we need to move to a world where we have more information about them so we're very clear of how we can get in front of them and what is to their liking so we can actually ask them something that they want. Imagine that. So the world of kind of inbound, and if you think of a brand, you say, well, who uses inbound well? Um, I'm going to throw out some companies like Apple. Right? So people come to Apple to get the next release. They, don't, they really don't have to do a lot of marketing for it. Um, under Armour, they come there. Zappos, they come there. So certain companies have done a brilliant job 
uh, Dick Sporting Goods has done a brilliant job of setting up ways that they are really talking specifically to you um, for you to engage with them. And they understand it's completely up to you and you've got a ton of competition out there and a ton of choices. And so every, every touch point they have with you always puts you in the driver's seat and it gives you choices about how to engage. And they respect that and they try to engage in different ways. Again, that's a new, for most organizations, that's a new thought pattern. They haven't thought of, they've thought of, oh, inbound marketing or marketing as, as itself as let's just keep sending out emails. That's not marketing. Okay, that email is a channel. That's all it is. It's a tool. That's not marketing. If you don't have an integrated campaign about how it all works comprehensively with the member in the middle of it and what that's going to mean to revenue, then you're not marketing. Okay, you're just, you're just doing tactical level stuff. So we need to be more strategic. As a matter of fact, in um, last year we put out a state of digital marketing and associations research study. And uh, if you haven't uh, downloaded that, I highly recommend it. And it showed just exactly this point that most associations don't have a strategic head of marketing. They don't have people in the C-suite. They maybe barely, we found, they have vice presidents. Um, it's, marketing is not really revered. It's not seen as a skill. The marketing people don't have the right skills. And um, many organizations, the strategy is really done by something else. So, and we're seeing that shift happen because right now we have the 2015 study open and we will re report that in August of this year. But even the preliminary numbers, we take kind of a, a, a slice of data and look at it on a monthly basis. We're already seeing that we, we've already substantiated that the market is, is heavily moving and you're getting more corporate types into the association world. You're seeing overhauls of organizations that said, I know we've done it this way for 18 years, but we have to change or we're in dire straits. And so, Many, many organizations, this is a very hot topic, which is why at High Road we talk about it all the time. We have a road show coming up on it, et cetera, um, because it's so new to this industry. So what are these five new areas that we need to explore to really do that? So five of the areas that make a huge difference in getting organizations to the mindset really of inbound and being able to do more with the IMAS data you already have is one, focusing on developing personas. So personas are a fictitious characterization of the ideal person or people representing a target market that you either want to avoid, like you don't want any more of those, like my gosh, if we have another Barbara that joins as a member, we're sunk. But maybe if we had 10 more Ted's, we'd be golden. So it helps you to kind of help focus in on who these right people are. You use them in segmentation. You use them to understand the buyer's journey. It also helps to align the organization. So instead of the events department fighting with the marketing department and they both decide that they hate the IT department, instead you can all say, hey, for this particular program, how is this going to work for this persona? How will they respond? And it gets the organization into a completely different dialogue that's not personal, it's not emotional, it's not about them, it's not about ego, and it's all about how do we work for the greater good of the organization. So what do those things look like? So here's one of our um, personas that we use. Typically, you actually pick out a picture. You uh, name them. This is my Benji DBA uh, persona. Um, he's one of the, the you know, continuous kind of groups of personification of, um, of people that we meet and that are important to us in our, in our sales journey and in our client work. And so what you do is you basically write a story about this Benji DBA character. And it's just, you know, an overall story. It's completely made up. It's just things that you've seen regularly. Now, your IMS data becomes really critical in being able to craft these personas. Because a great way to do it is say, okay, we're going to create a persona. Let me run some queries and pull out, okay, let me pull out all the, um, the job titles, um, all of the states, all of the, let me, you know, start slicing and dicing my data so I can see my distribution. So if I start seeing that, I have, you know, 80% of all of my members are, have a job title that includes the word sales or marketing or, um, uh, or like a government affairs or something. And I can start bundling those together. I can say, okay, well, how does that then relate to how well that they pay their dues, how well they attend conferences, how well that they are actually performing the desired actions. So the IMAS piece of it, of being able to use that querying uh, to get some of this data out becomes really critical to developing really good personas. And then you're going to pick out a couple of people and say, you know, actually do interviews with them and whatnot. But it helps you to not only find out 
who you want to target. It also helps you to say, we don't want to keep attracting these people or that we've got enough of that population. Like we've got the government affairs group sewn up. We don't need another one of those. That's not going to help us get to our strategic goal. What we need to do is grow the number of physicians we're talking about. And being able to use those personas helps us to really identify who we want to target. And we're going to do it from a database, data, statistical driven method, uh, and we're not guessing, right? We're going to look at, like, you always get someone who says, oh, yeah, well, we, you know, we always need, we don't want to have, you know, get another Barbara. But you might find out that, in fact, even though Barbara's a squeaky wheel or what have you, uh, her kind, people like Barbara, also take up 90% of the revenue or contribute to it. So we don't want to really rock that boat too hard, but maybe we need to do something else with that piece of it, right? And so if we can then identify, okay, we need the millennials, we need to go over, you know, more people um, named Caitlin, and we're going to name her Caitlin as our persona. Uh, if we had more Caitlins, we only have five of them. And then we can set a growth goal to say, well, if we n bumped up the number of Caitlins we had to more like a 10% lift in that, what would that mean in revenue? That's how you start thinking about how we're going to use personas effectively. So we're going to use those personas, and that's a big one. And so usually the typical answer is if we had our Benji VBA and we found out we vetted the solution or we vetted the hypothesis that more Benjis would equate to more um, revenue, the right type of revenue, right, which is um, maybe all the Benjis always register early for the conference, and we could get rid of early bird and instead take them for full price because they've always gone and give them something in addition so they feel valued. But if we had more Benjis and we showed that's the group that we want, then the simple answer for us to grow or to evolve or to increase engagement is that we need more Benjis. The bottom line, it becomes really crystal clear. So then the question comes becomes, the second part is kind of new, is that we got to then say the, the question at hand is how do I get more Benjis and how do I know that it's working without guesswork? That becomes the next kind of piece. So if I have to go hunting for more Benjis, remember, if I only have, let's say, 100 Benjis in my, in my IMS database, um, I could email the same 100 people and hope that they convert to membership, maybe their prospects, you know, or I could go get new prospects. And that's where you hear a lot of associations are now. They said, look, we've exhausted our list. We can't buy email lists anymore like we used to. We certainly can't fax people. Like, we don't know how to get these people. So typically they turn to digital means to do that um, so that they can attract more people. So in order to go hunt for them, we got to go where the Benjis are, right? Where are the Benjis swimming? So we got to go to their same watering hole so we can find these people and try to attract them with something that's of interest to them. Because I told you before, you can't, you can't like, hoodwink anymore one anymore. It's really obvious and it's seen as just totally obnoxious if you just walk up to someone and you're like, hey, do you want to join now? You can't do it. It doesn't work in today's world. It's obnoxious. So if every email you send has a big join now or register button on it, it's, it's incredibly obnoxious. I can't say it enough. It's completely out of style. It is just, it just rubs people the wrong way and they see it instantly as spam and they ignore the message. You have no rapport built up with them. So you're skipping the social step, which again, 10 years ago, you could still do that. Nowadays, you can't do that. Same way, same way if you, every communication you send, you're so afraid of offending someone that it goes into this like completely corporate political speak that says nothing, it's also not going to work because people don't speak that way anymore, right? Especially if you have to look at the generational kind of aspects to that. So when we're going to hunt for Benji's, we've got to find the right watering hole, right? And we've got to go through this five-step process. This is the process. We've got to understand our current data. We just talked about that. We've got to set some traps to go hook some Benji's. We've got to measure the traps, set more traps, lead Benji through a process of hooking him so we get to the point of conversion. And then once the Benji is converted, we need to continue back through the same cycle to continue to serve up something of value and treat Benji really well. So that's how we get engagement, okay? So the first part, really one through five, is talking about acquisition. After you convert, you're now in the world of engagement. So it's not the same world of retention like we've got them and now we'll just renew them uh, when the renewal time comes up. It doesn't work that way. You've got to continually 
be able to um, invest in your relationship with Benji and your communications and everything else have to be something that makes Benji feel very special, right? Because we're, we're left the world of everybody gets a trophy. This is everybody now as an individual and everybody else, you know, has the right to choose what they want to, you know, have on their burrito or their burger or their pizza or whatnot. Everything is this world of hyper customization, hyper personalization. And that's what consumers to a large degree expect. So they don't want to get treated if, if Benji, if the Benji that I'm trying to hook is 32 years old, that person does not want to feel like they're being, they're, that the letter that they're getting, the email that they're getting really is intended for like a 52 year old. It's offensive. So we got to be able to really get good at that communication aspect of it, but we can't do it in today's world without technology and the data, okay? There's just not enough time in the world to do that. So going through the first part of it, we got to understand our current data. So what we usually do when we go out and consult is we look at your current data. We do some of this persona development we were talking about, and uh, what we do is we look to see, you know, are you on IMIS? If you're on IMIS and you're using RISE, oh, wonderful, because we can get so much data out of and we understand the topic preferences and things from your content side and also we can do this contextual marketing for emails that we've been talking about. We're going to look at Google Analytics, you look through social media and you notice we're tying together all of our channels here, traditional and quote unquote new. Though I have to tell you, social media is not new anymore. It's been around for a long time. So um, as a matter of fact, I just celebrated my seventh Twitter birthday. So it's been a long time that it's been out. You can't call something that's seven. If there's a seven-year-old kid running around, you can't call him a newborn, right? So we have to be able to have the same understanding with, um, with our technology. Um, so social media, certainly we want to look at phone logs if we can, support tickets, email, webinars, stuff in your learning management system, event system, and then actually interview people. So anywhere along the way where you, we have data we can collect, um, we want to be able to look at that and see if we see any trends and any sort of correlations there. So you're going to do the kind of an internal audit to understand what you know. This is back to the, do I know what I know? Okay, and then what, probably more importantly, what things don't I know that if I did know, it would make a big difference? I'm going to give you a really easy um, piece of bait on this one. Okay, the most common way that millennials um, communicate is, uh, comes to be, right, comes to be either in person or text. So the phone call thing is kind of seen as very, very personal. Uh, many times not pick up the phone. They text first, et cetera. Email is seen as an indicator as to what things are happening elsewhere, like they're getting a blog notification email, or unless they really understand and it's going to really resonate with them. It's like this, I, even the concept of newsletter is what? So, uh, but text, text is very popular. Now you know what you need in order to text people? You gotta have their phone number and you gotta know their mobile carrier. And one of the things that associations have historically done is not collect that information because we have this fear that we are gonna always over ask for more info and that's gonna be offensive and people won't give it to us. Well, that is a very, that is true if we're talking at a high level about the baby boomer generation, okay? If we are talking about though the Gen X, and the Gen Y, the millennial generation, very different viewpoint. Happy to give you all of my information. If there, you have a really good reason why, you tell me why, and I'm going to get something for it, right? So if there's a value exchange. So associations now are doubling back, like we've got to add mobile to our membership forms or event registration forms, and we've got to ask the question, you know, why we're asking for that, and do you want us to, would you prefer to get communications you know, how do you want communications? Do you want to get email? Do you want to get direct mail? You want to get text? And being able to constantly ask their preference and let that user drive the experience is a key part of this kind of new mindset. Second part we were talking about is we got to set traps for Benjis. So we got to hunt where the Benjis are. We're going to use, uh, give them choices and use content as bait. So common social areas, these are kind of the common watering holes, if you will, or ponds that we would find uh, our, our Benjis, we need to identify, can't be everything, uh, we need to identify where we're going to likely find these people. Common areas are all the places on social. Those are also always awesome because you get the data from it and it's measurable very clearly. But you can also use, you can still use things like print ads and on-site things and, you know, um, 
things that you put in bag drops. There's, I mean, even the traditional stuff, you can kind of digitize it in ways to make it interesting. Even badges, name badges at events, you can do some very cool stuff. So we need to hunt where the Benjis are. And then in order for them to get hooked, we got to provide good bait. And that means that we have to have, again, the right content, good offers, maybe contests, maybe coupons, maybe testimonials from recognizable names that they'll relate to and really say, oh, okay, if they're, you know, if LeBron James is part of your association, then, you know, maybe I should, I should give it a read. So whatever is going to work to get people hooked, that's going to be of interest. So, for example, again, you have to match up the right people. So if I have a download an ebook for someone who's very new to the organ, you know, new to the industry, new to their career, um, obviously that's not going to resonate with someone who is maybe, you know, who's been 30 years in the career. And that's designed to be that way, right? We have to, again, get, okay, that this isn't everybody gets a trophy. We're not designing now for everyone. We're designing for the few, okay? That alone can cause some interesting dynamics in organizations, you know? They're used to having to design everything, events, everything like, it has to be no argument from anyone. But now you're seeing the carve out and having these micro kind of segments and saying, no, it's okay. If we have a carve out group that gets together within the event that's just for a particular special interest group, that's fine. You know, and we have a whole program for them because that's who we want to grow that, um, that particular population. So we got to go and hunt where they are, and we got to serve them up content. And I was saying, even at um, High Road, we do this still with print and digital ads. So not just our own properties, but things that we're buying out on other people's sites. So we're a big sponsor of NIAG. We had um, print ads in the book at the event. Um, every one of those things includes links or includes something in there that if somebody should use that and come back to us, I will know from whence they came, okay, because we track all of our URLs. So that becomes really important that we can, again, get information because i got to know what sources are working for me. That's one of the key things. If I find out I put, uh, again, just like if I'm fishing, if I have bait and it's across different areas of my pond or lake or whatever, I'm going to find the hot spots and I'm going to continue to now put more effort into those hot spots than into the places where fish never came. Okay? That's what we're doing. Identifying where these new people are that we don't know and how we can, uh, which are the hot spots. And in doing that, we want to go to the third part, which is measuring those traps, right? So measuring um, where, the, uh, where I've gotten some sort of indicator that there are, in this case, let's say, fish around. So I can do things like be able to use a page that you're seeing in the left-hand corner um, that is uh, very pretty and that has interactive forms with it so I can continue to get smarter about these people and they're opting into telling me information that gets, gives me more insight. And I can then understand the game becomes how do I get people to this page, okay? I'm going to break a big other kind of thing here. If you're currently saying we need to update our RISE site and redesign it or start on RISE and redesign it, and you're only putting on an RFP to a company that just does websites, you're missing a big part of it. Because here's the thing. Don't spend all your money on redoing your website and converting thousands of pages of content um, until you've really done a dig, deep dive on who's really using this stuff and, um, and how they're getting there. And that's kind of one of the big pieces because most organizations are missing the entire world of banner advertisement, Google AdWords, LinkedIn ads, Twitter ads. Um, they're missing all these things about lead gen to get people to the website. They spent all their money and time focused in on the website. But that's only effective if people are getting there. So we need to spend more time, and we saw that plain and clear in our 2014 uh, State of Digital Marketing report about where people are spending their time and money. And it was like completely 98% in email and on their website. And again, that's awesome for retention when you already know the people and you're bringing them back for something. That's really, really bad if you're trying to do a growth and acquisition to people who don't know you because you've just, you're not even talking to them. They have no idea your website exists, okay? That idea that one day they get up and every member will go to your site first, yeah, that's not happening. So we need to constantly constantly be in the business of getting in front of these people and drawing them back to a site. So even with the case of landing pages, I built a landing page and I put it out there. No one's going to that thing unless I'm, I'm um, 
I have out there other things to help attract people to say, oh, there's somewhere I should go and get them to come to the landing page. So I'm understanding here how I get these people to the landing page or the website or what have you. And I can see how much direct traffic is happening, emails pushing people there, um, organic search, other campaigns, and paid search, for example. So I need to be able to measure across this omni-channel world, and if I went through and clicked down into, let's say, um, offline sources or other campaigns, we would get down to saying, oh, I've labeled it for this particular print ad or this particular direct mail campaign or this particular banner ad. So I've got to measure these things nowadays to understand from whence the people came, and I need to do it effectively. Many marketing departments do do this, but it's in so many different places that to be able to analyze it together and put it all together is very difficult. It's too time consuming, so it's like it's on the list because they're, they're so focused on sending email, they can't do it. So, oh, and here's where I'm showing you. So they, um, so even with our indirect campaigns, like you look here on our numbers, our, the campaigns we're seeing there for the 2014 State of Digital Marketing, 2015 High Road U, and 2015 um, SDMA, those are things that are coming from um, print ads or banner ads elsewhere in the world, okay? Now, when I am trying to engage with these Benjis and hook them, um, the, one of the best ways I can do that is by giving them, again, a plethora of choices, leading them through a, a design series to engage them, not all at once, but maybe a little bit at a time. So I can do this for a couple ways. I can ask what topics they're interested in, what their interest areas are, are they most likely to, hey, if you go to a conference, are you most likely to want to learn in a group or learn by yourself? Um, are you, um, I would prefer a networking event that is we open up a bar and I love to just work the room and just meet random people, or I would prefer an event where uh, you're facilitating the network for me, right? And I just have to follow the program, like speed dating or something like that. Um, we ask questions like, hey, what are you up for? Are you up for tweeting, taking photos, walking on the red carpet, um, eating chocolate? Will you, you know, provide signatures? I mean, it can be fun and it can be silly. But, but the choices that people are making are telling you how they perceive themselves. That's the important part. You could ask anything. We have something to say, what's your favorite, when you're a kid, what was your favorite lunchbox? Who's your favorite superhero? And again, they may or may not have anything to do directly with um, exactly like whether they join or not, but you're starting to understand who these people are as a person, as a comprehensive level, because as we all know, the world between business and professional, or sorry, business and your private life, professional and private life, are very blended together now, which means we have to treat them comprehensively. In this kind of always connected world, we need to know more about them. And the, the more we know, if we can know their toothpaste brand, we'd be in good shape. And how, so, so how are some other ways we do this? One of the key ways that you can do like today is put in an email preference center. So we build and design email preference centers all day long. And why is that? Because our study shows only 40% of associations even have an email preference center. Most of them just have a link that says global opt-out. Or you can opt out of just one or two types of email newsletters or something. You're missing a golden opportunity to collect data and preference information. Here we're looking at um, ASAE's preference center, and you notice that they're not only asking you what do you want to opt in and out on for these particular types of newsletter, but they're even asking how often do you want to get Associations Now Plus. And you can choose from weekly or monthly um, or daily and be able to see what you want to do there. They're also asking what are your topics of preference? What kind of content do you, are you interested in receiving? They, not only do they ask that, if let's say I said, yes, I'm interested in fundraising, they have subtopics, you then can say, what level of a learner am I, or my, my familiarity with that content, what level am I? Am I introductory? I'm a newbie to this topic? Um, I'm, in the, I'm a practitioner of the topic? Or I'm really an expert, I'm at the strategic level of, let's say, talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities. You know, so that could be a big difference. If you're getting advanced articles on mortgage-backed security and you just started in the field, you're not going to read it because it's not appropriate to you. Similarly, what often happens is we go to this lowest common denominator and, and we have this content that's all introductory content, but the member who's been a member for 20 years, they're way past that. And so they don't want to be bogged down with content that's fluff because, again, you cannot hoodwink them. They know the difference. So they're, they want to get the stuff that's the right information for them personally. 
So you can then further use what we were talking about about forms and do something called progressive profiling. So progressive profiling, and by the way, the email preference center, just to finish that, that usually sits, it's a piece of middleware, it sits between your IMS database and uh, whatever you're using for your digital communications, right? So whether you're using whatever, if you're only doing email marketing, whatever that system is, or if you're using an inbound platform, whatever that system is. And we interface that email preference center, we use it for a lot more than email. We interface in um, event uh, registration systems like eTouches and eShow, um, PR systems like Vocus, uh, all advoc other advocacy systems, all sorts of stuff. Go through that email preference center because it's such a great opportunity to be able to catch people and give them choice and no better way to give them choices than to um, collect what they're interested in, et cetera, across your publications. So in progressive profiling, back to that, you're going to use a form to continue to get smarter. So the first time I've ever, remember our, our whole goal, the whole goal is to get the email address. So maybe I was out on LinkedIn and I saw a banner out, ad out there um, for 2015 for the study and I clicked on it. I'm coming to the landing page and the goal is I got to get their email. Got to get their email. So of course I'm going to collect some e information around that. Uh, I can choose what I want to make if required, but I want that email. The next time I come back to this or to any form on my site where I'm using these landing pages, I can use progressive profiling. So now all I need to do is put in my email address and I'm served up automatically. I'm not asked again for my first name, last name, blah, blah, blah. I'm only asked for uh, what is my role? How do I see, how do I perceive myself as my role in my organization? And I have four choices. And this is an asking job title. This is how they perceive themselves. They say, oh, you know what? I perceive myself as manager of all things data and measurement. That's actually what I do all the time. Well, wouldn't you know that that perfectly aligns if you're a member to our Benji DBA profile, his persona? So now they've automatically opted themselves in to a persona. Now I can send emails with smart content based on persona and things like that. One step closer, I know a little bit more about this person that between selecting into visionary or manager of data and measurement or marketing or chief digital, they're putting themselves at this manager level and they see themselves as being very interested in data. Now I can come up with some good ideas now as to predict what kind of content they will and won't like. Would Benji DBA want to get an email that's all about graphic design? Probably not. So I can already make some, you know, some um, educated guesses as to what we want to do. Another example of using that content as bait is uh, this is Military Officers Association of America. They send out an email and basically they have levels of um, membership. So what they do is that this email is different for each type of persona really that they're, you know, target group that they're sending to. So they get a, a basic um, email to say, hey, this is all automated. So again, the staff hasn't touched this. So after they join in so many days, they automatically get this email saying your basic membership is just the beginning. Do you want to upgrade? They outline what you can do so it's interactive with them. And then you can go ahead and move through a series of trying to get them to now upgrade to the next level of membership. So one thing farther to move them down the, um, the space of knowing your member better. So, um, so what can you do with all that? So I was mentioning that the ASC Preference Center. So what ASC does is they use something called contextual marketing is the name of the kind of sub-discipline in marketing, to put out the Associations Now Plus newsletter. Now this is the, this is all about what putting automation and inbound together, okay? So they put together this newsletter and they never touch it. So when I say that, we built the template and the design and the logic behind it and its functionality and ASC never, the staff never ever puts this email together. And how that works is that we are combining the, the data that they have in their AMS, so it could be the data you have in IMS, with the content that they have in their content management system, in your case, RISE, or maybe Kentico, or what, what that would be. And they put that together along with that profile information that you have in IMS. And they then say, and they've asked these questions on the um, member profile to ask them those, you know, what kind of content do you want, what, what level and whatnot. And it automatically, the, the logic of this newsletter, uh, for each individual person, it goes out for that person and it scrapes the data, the content, and any of those preferences, and puts it all together automatically, automatically orders 
and pulls out the subject line, automatically orders the, um, you're going to have three articles from business operations and two from technology or whatnot, and then it sends that out and no one's touched it. It's all been automated. But the key here of when it becomes really into inbound is that as the person might have said, I'm interested in leadership, but in fact, they're always clicking on these business operations articles. So over time, the newsletter gets smart, and they say, they start putting the leadership down. You said you want it, so the newsletter will still give it to you, but it's going to continue to push it down the page because really, in reality, you've reported leadership, but in reality, you're always showing the behavior of business operations. So it's going to reorder that for you, and you don't have to touch it. Now, this type of solution is awesome for the world of IMS and RISE because it's all in one system, and you've got the taxonomies in there, and you've got all the, you know, it's all nicely buttoned up. And then, you, again, that takes care of your big kind of newsletter content kind of pieces. You don't even touch it. You can put banner ads in here, et cetera. You can do all that, radically reduce your staff time, and then use communication suite for all of your, you know, one-off emails, your renewal emails, um, your join emails, any of that stuff. But then you've got automation now really working and using the power of IMS and RISE, and you've freed up a ton of time. Now we can get, again, that's where my time's going to come for my personas and for my proactive questioning and things like that. Don't forget that other data to get you smarter about Benji and be able to really understand them is by using things like communities. Your communities give you tons of information. They're collecting massive amounts of information on that individual person and the behaviors that they're showing, what, what groups they're in, what um, topics they're talking about, you know, do they participate in discussions, you know, on and on and on. Online learning, if you use a learning management system, we use InReach, love it because of the reporting that I get out of it. It allows me to not only have content that's like certification content or content that I have to pay for, but it also allows me to have content that's free that I'm using for flat out lead generation. So I'm sitting there every month and looking behind to say, look at the popular topics, look what people are actually interested in. How did I come up with my questions for the 2015 State of Digital Marketing Association? I looked at what people, the topics they're actually using, the questions they asked me, who these people are on social, et cetera, and we came out with the content that people are interested in, and when you know it, you know, our numbers are through the roof because I'm simply giving information to, to what people are actually displaying their behavior of what they want. Blogs are another great way to do it. We're moving from an email-centric world to a blog-centric world. Why? Because there's a generational shift, nine times out of ten. Blogs are easier. They actually uh, provide an email subscription notification, so that allows it to come out, and then I'm automatically taking people back to the blog, and I'm getting all of that rich data between, it, did they open the blog email notification, did they, which tends to be higher open rates, did they click on something, and when they came back to the blog, I got all of their data now and what they've done. Okay? That leads us to the third big thing, which is conversions. So once they've done the action that I want, I now can study it, right? And I can now study it. So let's say that I put this out, this person filled out that survey, they want to download the report, and now I'm going to look at their, the, who this person is. And I can say, who is this person? Meet George. Well, I know George is, has opted into this Benji persona, but what do I know about George specifically? And I can come down here and I can start looking at the information. So if one thing is I have his Twitter username, because it scraped it from the social web, so I can immediately follow him. But I get this big timeline. I can see from the start of what um, George did here how we've been interacting with him. So starting from way back in November, I have been delivering emails. I can see that he clicked one email here. So deliver, deliver, but didn't open, click. Digital Marketing Learning Day. That somehow piqued his interest, enough that he became a lead, enough that we started keeping delivering stuff to him, and now we're watching about when he when he uh, interacted and converted. So he did enough interactions here, and I can score that, that on December 12th at 3.16 p.m., he magically became a lead. Something caused that to happen, and now I can come in and get more. Now I can start moving into when do I make the ask for Benji to register or to join or whatever the desired response. But he's showing me even more. He's starting to raise his hand like, I know you. I'm interested in you. I'm opening your stuff. I'm reading your stuff. I'm landing on your blog. I want to know more, and that helps us to align our timing, our cadence in this relationship with George that we're having virtually so that I don't uh, come off as obnoxious and I lose him, right? I got to coax him in, and we have to build a rapport before I can ask him, you know, do you want to become a member, all right? 
So the fourth thing is we got to focus on those touch points. So once I got the conversion, once I have George kind of on the hook, right? That's not, I'm not done. We got to feed the monster. We're not just trying to catch them and kill them. We're trying to catch them and continue to nurture them and grow them. And we're trying to have healthy relationships. So what are other ways you can do that in the digital world that people do? They continue to try to inter engage with people through all of these different channels that are now available to us that also have the metrics. SlideShare, for example. Put up your slides from everything you do and you can use it for tracking. It's amazing the amount of data you get out of SlideShare. And again, you don't do anything. You just put it out there and let it go. Okay, and come back and watch the topics and what people are doing with it and whatnot. LinkedIn, probably the most underused tool in all of association marketing. I can run campaigns on there. I can do um, campaigns that can be very economical, but I get really, really precise targeting and I get extremely good data. I can do retargeting campaigns. That's when, you, you know, have you ever gone to like a site and you are shopping for something and then you go to like something completely different like Yahoo and that ad follows you? That's a retargeting campaign. It keeps it as top of mind, keeps our name out there in front of them so that the day that they're ready to, you know, register or, or you know, we're, again, we're coaxing them in. We get, they, people don't buy now if they're not really aware of your brand. They're not going to do it. It's not how it, they don't take it for, you don't say like, well, the, you know, the company said that, um, you know, it was going to work. No, they have to either have somebody else substantiate the fact. They got to get familiar with you. They got to experience it. Retargeting is a great way to do that. Again, with the learning management system, this is our evaluation survey that goes out after every one of these. It's amazing how much data is in here. And so the way that I ask questions helps me to really understand what people want. And then at some point I just say, what topic do you want, right? And it's, I can't believe 101 people have told me the other topics that they want. How easy is it for me to now, I don't even have to sense anything. They're telling me what they want, okay? And I can look at those people and say, are they characteristic of the type of members or clients or prospects or registrants or attendees or whatnot that I'm, I'm, I'm seeking? Social media, certainly, this is like an easy one. But you can actually see there's a ton of data behind social media, so I can take that into the equation, too. And hopefully, again, I have an inbound platform where this is just done automatically for me. And also, I don't want to miss out on talking about Pinterest, which most people um, dismiss, but it is amazing what they can do for your search engine um, rankings and also again the data you get behind for what people are building or what they're clicking on or repinning etc again a way to get your brand out there and get people familiar with you so they can come and start to convert so at the end of the day this means that we've gotten to the fifth part of what's really new and that is that you got to evolve your staff this is a different type of person we're talking about this is a different job this isn't cutting and pasting and uploading lists and putting in an email and testing around three different browsers this isn't somebody doing data entry and, you know, pulling reg lists and looking at it. This is a world where you're in scientific kind of mode. You're doing hypotheses, you're testing, you're tweaking, you're studying, you're, you're doing forecasting. You really have to be super curious. And also you're very good at kind of matchmaking of putting, again, the constant goal of putting the right content with the right person at the right time and understanding how well you're doing that, constantly testing and tweaking that. So the questions that we now ask, or that the organizations have gone through this evolution process, now they ask questions like, what are they using? What are they like? What could they be using? What do they know about? What don't they know about? And the entire dynamic has changed of the overall organization because everybody's not finger pointing and they're not down into the minutia of tactical world. They're up at strategic world asking interesting questions because humans like to actually think. The, if, you know, the native state is to just be like flatline, but actually to get people excited and unleash the energy and the potential of the organization, you got to have puzzles to solve. And that constant puzzle piece is also if you're wondering, hey, how do we get better um, hires or better engagement from our different generations here, you got to focus on that puzzle and the gaming aspect, right? That's how you can hook in, I dare say, the millennials. It's got to be the constant challenge, et cetera. They don't want to come in and be a low-level email marketer. That's not challenging. It's not interesting. It's terrible. The technology is old, et cetera. They don't want to do rigmarole. They want to do interesting things. This stuff is very interesting. So this is going to resonate well, and it re people respond well. So at the end of the day, what does this become for our staff? We become experienced designers. We're not order takers. We're not 
uh, trying to just uh, what the member says we do. We're not scared that the member is coming to us. We're excited. We want them to engage. We want them talking back. We want to be in this constant digital dialogue. And so what that gets us is the extra six part of, the, uh, of today's conversation, which it gets us to totally different measurements. And finally, we're at this point where we can say, if I put money into it, this is looking at a campaign level, if I put money into a campaign, what did it elicit in responses? And is this what I'm trying to do? This gets into real engagement and also being able to track your spend, which typically marketers have a horrible time doing. So this is helping you across all these omni channels be able to track our spend and probably more important, understand how much we've gotten out of understanding these new Benjis and these personas and getting us farther ahead to our goal of, let's say, growth or better engagement. So those new behavioral levels of insights come at three levels, three flavors. The individual level we talked about, I can look at the George level, I can look at the group level, which is the persona level, and I can look at the population level, which is that campaign level. That gives me so much more power to start predicting about what we should do forward and sensing and responding, and I get forward thinking and not retroactively thinking where everybody is kind of um, nitpicking each other, okay? The real results of all of that measurement and everything we're doing here is that it really does result in getting smarter, pro proactive, creative, decreasing guesswork, which includes fear, uh, the reprimand thing, I mean, it's more of an experience test mode. Um, and actually, at the end of the day, it has real revenue uh, drivers and it has more impact, right? And that's what most of us associations truly we're going for. We all can agree that if we could do these goals, if this was your goal for the next project, everybody would say, I'm in. And so that's why you're seeing organizations so excited about being able to go to this next level of IMIS and inbound and do more with this because now you can really leverage that IMIS data that's retroactive, you know, his, all your historical data to get proactive and do more with it. So if you're interested in this, a couple of brief little plugs. Um, this topic is so popular, we're taking it on the road. We have a full day free seminar that we're doing in New York, Chicago, Toronto, and DC. Um, the Chicago one will also be live streamed, but if you're in any of those, please let me know. New York kicks off actually next Friday and we have a couple of seats left. We also have the inbound lunch bunch. You can attend in person in DC or virtually. Um, and that is, again, people that are interested in this topic. Free, get some CAE credits, we have a good time. Uh, we kicked it off last month with 150 people. We're over 230 for uh, May, and that happens actually um, May 14th, okay? And lastly, if you're not part of High Road U and doing more with this, you should. And if you don't know, we have toolkits in there. We've got documents. We've got webinars. And uh, we also um, usually uh, video our live stream events, so we have them for posterity and for repurposing. So with that, this is uh, me wrapping up. I'm Suzanne Carowin. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at High Road. Absolutely feel free to reach out to me or any of my colleagues, and uh, you can tell we're impassioned about this topic, um, and we're impassioned about helping the IMIS community do a lot more. So please feel free, and uh, we will be at the rest of the year's um, NIAG events, and anything on the, uh, on the IMIS side, feel free to reach out to myself, and we will uh, have a great discussion. With that, I wish everybody a great day, and have a great weekend. Thank you, Ms. Carwin. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today at the U. For Don't Miss, I Miss, Five Ways to Measure That Might Be Passing You By with Suzanne Carawan from High Resolution. This concludes today's program. Have a great day, and you may now disconnect. <laughs>